Hi, Paul Sladk. It's Good News Broadcast. I'm speaking to Dr. Ian Flynn. Hi, doctor. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Good. You're the director of hematologic malignancies research program, Sarah Cannon Research Institute. Uh, where are you guys located? We're in Nashville, Tennessee. Okay. And we have Jason Green, who has a chronic myeloid leukemia patient. Hi, Jason. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks. Great, Jason. Jason, thank you very much for uh, coming out and talking about uh, a personal uh, uh, occurrence in, in your life here. And uh, maybe, Doctor, you can give us some background. Sorry. So Jason um, has chronic myeloid leukemia, which is a, a rare type of, of blood and um, of, of, of blood cancer and bone marrow cancer, which, which the body produces too many white blood cells. Um, it's rare in the sense that it's responsible for only 10 to 15 percent of all adult leukemias. Um, Jason um, was, um, we were fortunate that he was able to participate in a, in a large clinical trial conducted um, here at Sarah Cannon Research Institute and elsewhere in, in the U.S. and throughout the world, um, looking at new therapies for patients with, uh, with CML. Uh-huh, okay. You know, what happens in a clinical trial? Uh, how, does, how does that work, and how do you find patients to, to, that are so bold to try? Right, so, so it starts with someone... Um, being interested, it, hopefully it starts with a with a patient being interested in participating in in a clinical trial. Um, it also starts with a, with a, with a doctor bringing it up to the patient. There are many trials that are now available in the community where where everyone lives. A lot of times, patients don't have to travel to large uh, metropolitan centers to participate in these trials. You brought up another point about you know someone being so bold as to participate in a clinical trial, and I think that has a little bit to do with perhaps stigma in the sense that many people think if you bring up a clinical trial, maybe things aren't going very well. Well, in fact, um, we really think of clinical trials as a very optimistic opportunity, and it does, it's not for, just for patients where things aren't going well, but it's often as frontline, first therapy for, for, for all patients or for many patients with leukemia and other forms of cancer. Okay, so it's good news by far, I right? Think, I, I really do think it's good news. Um, it means that we think we can do better than we've been doing in the past. And those that are doing it are, uh, once again, as I use the word bold or brave, uh, um, they'll, uh, in their own cases, uh, uh, help themselves. Well, uh, Jason, uh, how, first of all, how did you know you had, had this CML? Um, I, I woke up one day and, and felt a, a, a large mass below my rib cage and, and didn't feel right, so I made an appointment with my family physician, and uh, they had an ultrasound done to see that I had an enlarged spleen, and then they did some blood tests and found out that my white, white blood cell count was uh, 20 times normal. Uh, he then referred me to Dr. Flynn, and a bone marrow biopsy was done, which determined that I had this uh, CML leukemia. So um, uh, Dr. Flynn just so happened uh, timing was uh, lucky for me. Uh, they were starting a clinical trial there, and... Uh, I qualified to participate in it and uh, decided to do so. Uh huh. Yeah, I'm reading here something about. Well, thank you very, very much for doing. So, how you, how you feeling today? I'm, I'm doing great. Uh, I'm able to do everything I was able to do before I got diagnosed. Uh, a lot of the uh, side effects that I, you know, that they said I possibly might experience, I haven't experienced any of them. So, uh, for me, it's been a it's been a positive experience. Has been the support around you uh, during this period of time? Yes, uh, definitely have uh, a great support around me, family, friends. Um, so uh, definitely, um, definitely, that's uh, definitely been a big help. Aha! Uh -huh. But when you initially went in, were you concerned? Were you worried that uh, you know about all these oh, kinds of things? Yeah, I mean, I was, I was terrified when my family physician told me I had leukemia because you know, my image of leukemia was you know, uh, you know not good you know ble people with bleeding noses uh, losing your hair uh, being really sick and since I it wasn't feeling any kind of pain or anything I was just completely taken back when, my, when he said that uh, he suspected I had CML um, so yeah it was, a, it was a big shock to me and, and my family um, and, uh, you know, luckily this clinical trial was going on at the Sarah Cannon Research Institute, and I was able to participate in it. So it's just been a, you know, 
I guess to have, to have gotten leukemia, uh, I was fortunate enough to get a leukemia that was um, treatable uh, with the new therapies that are available today. Good job, Dr. Flynn. This is uh, <laughs> Leukemia and Lymphoma uh, Awareness Month. And I'm reading here that there's a, um, a newly diagnosed, I don't know, they call it the Philadelphia chromosome. <laughs> what is that, in cheesesteaks? What, what, what's a newly diagnosed Philadelphia chromosome positive chronic uh, CML? Uh, what, what is that? And how does that come about? How do you then learn about something new? So, well, so, the, um, so there's several, several different stages of, CML, chronic myeloid leukemia, there's a, a chronic phase or an early phase, which is what Jason had. And unfortunately, some patients, they're diagnosed, it's, it's progressed, and it's much harder to treat. It's more along the, you know, blast, blast crisis. It's a much more difficult uh, disease to treat. Um, the Philadelphia chromosome refers to a specific genetic change um, that was, this was discovered actually many years ago, um, but it's a specific genetic change that, um, that moved a couple chromosomes around and, and and was the cause for the for CML. The, the, the new thing, and, and which really occurred over the last 10 years, is therapies that are directed specifically at the um, this chromosomal abnormality um, at, the, the, at what caused the what, what caused CML. And that's what um, the originally drug Gleevec, which was a revolutionary drug in, in the treatment of CML, um, targeted. And now Tisigna, this drug that Jason's on, this is also been a, a significant advancement in our therapies for patients with CML. Uh huh. Okay. And what does a drug like that do? Um, it, it really blocks the the production of the it blocks the formation of the leukemia. And so it it's there's always probably very small amounts of leukemia left in in patients who have uh, who've been treated with one of these medications, but it it reduces it to such small levels that we don't even. Uh, it's, it's almost impossible to detect. Do we know why someone gets or some things that people might be doing that gets, uh, you know, the, where they end up having leukemia? So I get this question every day in, in, my, um, in my practice, and, and the truth is for almost everyone we, that comes, comes in with, with, with CML or related disorders, we don't know why. Um, they, they, were, they got this cancer and, you know, someone else, their next-door neighbor, someone else didn't. It's... it's there are a few um, toxic chemicals that we've known for a long time that are that can produce leukemia, but but for most people, they have no exposure to any of these things, and so for most people, it remains a mystery. Uh huh. Okay. And so to to resolve this mystery, I mean, so you've mentioned a couple uh, drugs that are helping to uh, um, stabilize this mystery, right? Because we've learned some things. Well, I really think that that these that, that these therapies for CML. I mean, CML is really a, a great success story, and, and we have a lot of work to do in other forms of leukemia, but in CML, it's, it's, it's more than just stabilized it. It's, it's, made it, it's made it so that we can't detect the disease anymore. And for many people, they have, to the best of our knowledge, a, a limitless hor horizon. We think they're going to continue to do well. And this is for the vast majority of patients now with CML, that they continue to take these medicines every day then they can go on and have a, a completely normal life. So, and then for you to know that somebody has CML and somebody has a, another type of uh, cancer, um, you know that through blood? Right, so there's a s series of tests that are done. We've, you know, first, as, as it happened with Jason, his white count was very high in his, in his blood, and his, doctors, in his, in his primary care doctor saw that. And he then sent um, Jason over to see us, and we confirmed this with a bone marrow biopsy in which we could do some of these more sophisticated tests, um, looking at the, the cytogenetics or what happens, the chromosomes in the, in the, in the uh, leukemia cells themselves, and not only know that he has leukemia, but what type of leukemia and how to best treat it. Uh huh. Well, uh, Jason, would you see, did, were you a, uh, an annual uh, um, checkup guy going to the doctor? Uh, actually, I had uh, the few years prior to that. I had gone in for regular checkups, but um, they typically don't do a full blood work on you uh, unless there's a reason to. Uh, so um, I had gone in for re you know regular checkups, regular physicals, but uh, a full blood work hadn't been done on me. Uh, so they, uh, you know, like I said, I wasn't experiencing any kind of pain or anything like that. So. Um, it just so happened I could, you know, got out of the shower one day and felt this mass below my rib cage and 
knew something wasn't right. It, you know, it wasn't there <laughs> previously, so uh, I went in and had it, had they, you know, like I said, they did an ultrasound on it and found I had an enlarged spleen, and, and that's when they ordered the, uh, the full blood work to find out that um, my white blood cell count was, uh, you know, was a lot higher than normal, so, um, you know, I guess, you know, I don't know if, if, if uh, on routine physicals, uh, this is all depends on, on uh, your, your position, but I'm not sure if they do full blood work uh, that would detect something like that on, on, in routine physicals. Uh -huh. Dr. Flynn, uh, are you a, a believer that once a year you get everything you possibly could get checked, checked? <laughs> you know, I, I think that's uh, how, much, how much to do, and, and there's a sort of limitless number of tests that you could run on somebody from just simple blood work to um, very extensive evaluation for, for CT scans, uh, right. evaluation of a heart. It's really hard to... to to know exactly what the right um, number of tests are. I, I think in, in, in Jason's case, in many people's cases, we have blood work on them three months or six months ahead. They went to their doctor and they had a, they have a, uh, a normal, normal blood count and it wasn't there uh, and it shows up, it can show up very quickly. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not clear how, how often people should get blood work done and he has such a form rare, rare form of leukemia to begin with. Okay, last question to for both of you then. Uh, doctor, uh, uh, what's good news for you? The good news is that um, I think we're making tremendous progress in, in blood cancers, um, and we're going to make more progress if people participate in, in clinical trials. Um, that's really the key to, to advancing cancer therapy. Great. Thank you very much. And Jason? Uh, good news for me is that, that I'm, I'm doing well and uh, that, uh, you know, I was blessed that, that there was a clinical trial available uh, for me to participate in. And I encourage people that, that, that have other types of uh, leukemia or, or cancer to, to check out the websites and, and find out uh, if there's a clinical trial going on in their area um, and see if uh, they would be eligible to participate in it. Okay, great. Thank you both very much, and, uh, uh, and best of health to both of you. Thank you so much. Thanks very Thank much. Bye-bye.